Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could find each other. I'm so happy that somehow in all this mess we were able to find each other during this wonderful beautiful little earthly rotation. If you're unfamiliar my name is Brittany or Brad or Scene, whichever you prefer and today we're going to be discussing the infamous but oftentimes erroneously reported murder of Kitty Genovese, one of the most famous murder victims of the 20th century. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out new videos every week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you. Do it. Do it. Join us. One of us. One of us. One of us. Now, Kitty Genovese. Her, her case and her story is one of the most popular murder cases to ever come out of New York City and it's one of those cases that I learned about when I was younger and it's been just like a sort of benchmark in the world as a sort of representation of the deterioration of mankind actually. That's, that's what they use it as. Even in The Boondock Saints, which if you are unfamiliar it's a movie, in the opening scene of The Boondock Saints they're talking about Kitty's case and the priest goes on to say, we must all fear evil men, but there's another kind of evil that we must fear most, and that is the indifference of good men. And that priest was talking about Kitty Genovese's case. This sort of myth and like folklore around Kitty Genovese's murder comes mostly from the media because the media, after Kitty was killed, put out an article, I believe it was the New York Times, that said that while Kitty Genovese was murdered in an alley behind her apartment building, over 30 people saw, heard, knew what was happening and chose to do nothing. Not to call the police, not to come to her aid, not to do anything. This narrative, however, that the media had been portraying about, about Kitty Genovese's murder has been proven over the years to be mostly false, but we're going to get into all that right now. So let's do that. Gather around and let me tell you about the tragic murder of 28-year-old Kitty Genovese. Catherine Susan Genovese, who later in life and as she grew up was known simply as Kitty, was born on July 7th, 1935, making her a cancer. She was oldest of five children to parents Vincent and Rachel, and the whole Genovese family grew up in New York City. Growing up, Kitty was known for her bubbly personality, her energy, and her sense of humor. She had gone to an all-girls high school, and she was super popular with all of her peers, and she won class clown in her senior year, and she was just remembered as like a good student and a happy and fun and well-liked person. Shortly after Kitty's graduation, Kitty's mother actually witnessed a shooting on the streets near their New York home, and rightfully scared, she decided that she wanted to move to a safer place to spend the rest of her year. So her, her husband, and her four younger children packed up their lives and moved to a safe little neighborhood in Connecticut. Kitty, now an adult, decided that she didn't want to go with her parents to Connecticut. She wanted to stay in New York. She grew up here. She liked it here. So she stayed and she worked first as a secretary at an insurance company and she moonlit as a bartender at a bar called Ev's 11th Hour. Kitty started out as a bartender at this bar, but she quickly was promoted to manager because she was just like a really hard worker. She was really good at what she did. So she ended up deciding that she wanted to work there full time and she wanted to move closer to the bar. So she ended up moving to Queens, New York. And here she worked until the day she died. She was really, really a hard worker and very valued at this at this bar. She would sometimes do double shifts because she was just trying to save as much money as possible because she had the dream of opening up her own Italian restaurant. So she was working really hard and saving all the money she could to put into her future and her dreams. So Kitty liked Queens and she stayed there the rest of her life. And while living in Queens, she met a woman, an aspiring painter at a lesbian nightclub. Mm-hmm. Spicy stuff, I guess, if you consider that spicy, which I don't, but for the time, it was very spicy. Uh, and the two hit it off right away and quickly fell in love and started a relationship and decided they wanted to move in together. So deeply in love, the two did just that. They went out and found a nice little apartment. It was a nice little second story apartment in Kew Gardens in uh, Queens, New York. And this area was thought at the time, at least, to be a really nice and safe place and like a good place to live. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit to March 13th, 1964, exactly one year to the day after Kitty met Marianne. So she's working a night shift at the bar. It's about 2.33 a.m. and she's really excited to get home and see Marianne since it's the one year anniversary of the day that they met. So she starts heading home from work. 
So Kitty gets home, she parks her car by like the train station and she starts walking to her apartment and while she's walking she starts to hear footsteps behind her and when she looks it is a man with a stocking over his face and a large serrated hunting knife. So panicked she starts running to her apartment building trying to get away from this man and she gets almost to her apartment but the man unfortunately catches up to her, grabs her and stabs her two times in the back. Naturally, because Kitty's being attacked and she was just stabbed twice in the back, she, she screams. And one of her neighbors looks out the window and thinks, unfortunately, that it's just a domestic disturbance that a couple is fighting. And he just yells, like, for the guy to leave that girl alone. And when he yells, the guy takes off running and leaves Kitty alone. Now, at this point, Kitty is stabbed and she's badly hurt, but she's still alive. And for some reason, I couldn't really figure out what the reason was, she ran to the back of her apartment building, like it down an alley. And when she ran down that alley, she ended up collapsing at the bottom of a flight of stairs out of the line of vision of any witnesses because she was no longer like on the main street. And sadly, this is where Kitty would lay alone, bleeding and in pain for 10 minutes before her attacker returned, robbed her, raped her, stabbed her, and then left her for dead. And this is where Kitty stayed, laying on the ground, suffering from several stab wounds and bleeding out when one of her neighbors, a woman named Sophie, found her, um, held her in her arms and started screaming out for somebody to call the police. But sadly, Kitty Genovese died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Shortly after Kitty's passing, the police knocked on the door of the apartment that Kitty and Marianne shared together. And they informed Marianne of her girlfriend's unfortunate murder and a detective named Mitchell Sang ended up coming to the apartment to then question Marianne and when he got there he found her with a neighbor of hers named Carl Ross just getting hammered you know trying to probably deal with the fact that the woman she loved was just killed on their anniversary. While detective Sang questioned Marianne Carl Ross kept kind of like interrupting and I couldn't find clarity on what exactly he was doing, but he got, he interfered so much with the questioning that he ended up getting arrested for disorderly conduct. And I actually wonder, I was thinking about it while I was like doing my research, I wonder if Sang thought that Carl Ross was a suspect because the flight of stairs where Kitty collapsed, I read, was a flight of stairs that led right up to Ross's apartment. Just food for a thought on like what the officer's thought process was on arresting this man who just learned that like probably a friend of his, I imagine if he's drinking with Marianne, he knew Kitty, but the fact that he would arrest this guy. Anyways, later in that morning, um, two more homicide detectives showed up to question Marianne, two male homicide detectives, a man named John Carroll and a man named Jerry Burns, and these two guys started to question Marianne, and their questions quickly turned very inappropriate. They started focusing in really hard on the fact that Kitty and Marianne were lesbians, as if this had anything to do with why Kitty was killed, but they started talking to them about the girl's sex life and the sex positions, like how do two women do that? You know, like how dare they be lesbians? And this interrogation, not questioning, interrogation lasted for six hours. And they, at one point even considered Marianne to be a suspect because they believed that gay couples were somehow inherently more jealous than straight couples. As if the statistics do not show that it's usually a white dude killing his partner, but okay. It just frustrates me a lot. It reminds me of that dickhead cop who interviewed Brandon Tina after his assault. It just makes me so frustrated to imagine these poor people in probably the probably dealing with the most horrible thing they're ever going to deal with in their entire life and then they have this cop that's supposed to be the person that's like there for them to protect them and to serve them and to aid them in this trying time and instead they're being freaking interrogated and verbally assaulted and it just pisses me off quite a bit to hear especially because like the only reason is because because they were gay because they were trans because I don't know it makes me mad but anyway I digress just don't be a dick, am I right? I don't know. 
Later that week, police actually got a lucky break in solving the Kitty Genovese murder case. So there was this man named Winston Mosley, and Winston had went and got himself arrested for stealing television sets. And when they, when they caught the guy, these television sets were in the trunk of his white Corvair. Corvair? I don't know cars. Anyway, so they, they haul Winston down to the police station. While they're there, the police are kind of like, wait a second, like little light bulbs turn on because they remember that when they were interviewing people about Kitty's murder, that people had reported seeing a white vehicle at the scene. Additionally, officers noticed that Winston had cuts and scabs and, you know, mangled up hands. So they were like, okay, I think maybe we could question him on this. So they go to him and they're like, hey, we think maybe you killed this girl the other night, right? And he was like, you got me. He buckled. He, he completely admitted to it and he told them information that only the killer could know. He just buckled and was like, yeah, you know what? I did. I definitely killed that girl. Winston Mosley. Let's talk about him for a little bit and let's talk about his confession. So he was a married man with a couple of kids and a couple of dogs living in New York and he had no prior criminal record but that night he was out in his car driving around Queens for one reason and one reason only and it was looking for someone to attack and poor Kitty just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. That night when Kitty left work as she was driving home she had been spotted by Winston Mosley while he was at a stoplight and he was like that's the one and he made a U-turn and he followed Kitty home where he then attacked her. He followed Kitty when she got out of her car and that's when he came up behind her, chased her and then stabbed her twice in the back. And when Kitty started to cry out for help and lights started to turn on in the building, he realized that he had left his car parked in a place where people would likely see it. So he ran off to move his car. He then sat in his car for a couple minutes to kind of wait and see if the police came because he knew that somebody had, you know, yelled out at him. That neighbor had been like, stop messing with that woman. So he sat in his car and he waited. And when he realized that the police weren't coming, he decided that he needed to finish what he started. Winston, man, you know, he just, he went out that night with nothing on his mind except for murder. And he had said later when they were interviewing him that when he got this idea in his head, he could think of nothing else until that deed was complete. So this guy was dangerous, dude. Like, okay, so in interrogating him, they found that he didn't have a record. Yes, but that's just because he hadn't yet been caught for the things that he had done. While in custody being questioned about Kitty's murder, he admitted to several other rapes and to two other murders. Winston admitted to the murder of a 24 year old black woman named Annie Mae Johnson, who had been killed two weeks prior to Kitty's murder. Annie had been shot and then burned to death in her home, but police had no suspects and her case did not get as much media coverage as Kitty's did. And just for clarity, I mentioned that Annie Mae was black because of the fact that she did not get the same media coverage that Kitty did, even though her murder was equally horrific and perpetrated by the same guy. Yet, I have never heard of her until looking into Kitty's case. Winston also admitted to the murder of 15-year-old Barbara Kralik, who had been murdered in July of 1963 in her family home. Winston claimed to have sexually assaulted both of these women before he killed them. And in the case of Barbara, there was actually a man who was arrested and being held for her murder. The man's name was Alvin L. Mitchell and Alvin had actually confessed to Barbara's murder for some reason. But Alvin then recanted his confession and Winston had details from both murders that only the murderer could have known. And even though those facts were true, he was never tried for either of these murders, but he did, however, just for peace of mind, in case you wanna know what happened to Alvin, he did end up testifying in Alvin's trial that he was the one who killed Barbara and not Alvin, but um, he was never tried for it himself. But Alvin's trial did end on a hung jury, so there's something. But that right there is a big reason why police can't just take confessions and run with it, because sometimes people confess to things they didn't do, and I'll never understand it. There's psychology behind it, but there's an example of it for you. So in the case of Kitty Genovese, Winston pled not guilty by reason of insanity, but he was eventually found guilty regardless, and he was given the death sentence in June of 1964. 
he did of course appeal this conviction and he won his appeal and got it switched from the death penalty to life in prison three years later in 1967. You would think at this point that we're done talking about old Winston Mosley, right? Wrong. This guy, dude, okay, so I found that prior to really looking into this case, there was so much about, first off, Kitty's case in general that I didn't know, and so much about her killer that just I didn't know, and it's so crazy, and in really digging into it and looking into it, I felt like I needed to bring you a little more information, okay? So, buckle in. This dude was wild. Okay, so while in prison, for the murder of Kitty Genovese. Winston intentionally injured himself and he did this by taking a can and I believe it was a spam can and shoving it up his own butt. So he had to go to a hospital. So he goes to the hospital and while he's on his way back from the hospital, he's not handcuffed, okay? And he is able to overpower the one guard they had watching him take his gun and escape into a field. So crazy. Like Winston at this point is 33 years old and he's just really strong and just beat the crap out of this cop and ran off, right? So, okay. So Winston, he finds an empty house where the owners were gone and he breaks in through a window and he hangs out in this house for a couple days until the homeowners come home. And when they come home, they're surprised to find this man in their house with a gun. And he stays there and he takes them hostage and he unfortunately rapes the wife and then steals the, the car and takes off again. When he takes off again, he ends up in an apartment building where he broke into this apartment building and it's a woman, I think it's two women and a kid. And he takes them hostage. And then one of the women's like, hey, like I need to go pick up my other kids or they're gonna be suspicious. So he lets her leave. She goes and she calls her husband. It's like, okay, I'm being held hostage. And then he calls the cops. And after a brief standoff, he is rearrested. So he's back in jail and every time his parole came up, it was denied. I wonder why. And he ended up dying in prison at the age of 81 in 2016. Wild, right? I felt like I just needed to tell you guys about that because I feel like I did not know any of that and it's just so interesting and so crazy. And I just thought you should know, okay. so. Okay, so the reason that Kitty Genovese's case got to be so famous and continues to be so famous, besides the fact that she was a white woman who was murdered, let's call it what it is, is because the media ran with the story that 30 plus people saw, knew, heard, were aware of what was happening to Kitty and chose not to intervene. But this has been proven in the years to have been wildly sensationalized and to be the 1960s version of like clickbait. You know what, and another thing, and this has nothing to do with why the case was sensationalized, but we're talking about the media at this point in the video and I would like to make a note. The media in this case purposely left out the fact that Kitty and Marianne were lesbians. They referred to them as roommates in their news articles because homophobia. And I just want to say that I need it to be clear because it's one of those things that kind of gets lost in her story. Kitty was a lesbian. Marianne was her girlfriend. Anyways, I just want to read you guys the exact quote from the New York Times article that was written about Kitty's murder. For more than a half an hour, 38 respectable law-abiding citizens in Queens watched a killer stalk and stab a woman in three separate attacks in Kew Gardens. So in that article that was headlined what I just read to you, it basically said exactly that, that on that night in March of 1964, 38 people watched as a woman was stabbed to death in three separate attacks, that two times at least the attacker was chased off by noise that the 38 people were making, and that each time he kept coming back and was stabbing her again. The article said that in all those 30 minutes, no one ever called the police and that Kitty died alone in the street and that no one came to her aid until after she was already dead. But we now know based on the story that I've already told you that that's not what happened. This idea and this theory and this narrative that the media was pushing was just trying to illustrate that 
we as a people are corrupt and morally bankrupt and not willing to do anything to help each other. But their story wasn't factual because we know, first off, Kitty was only attacked twice. Um, <sighs> Kitty didn't die alone. She was helped by one of her neighbors and she died after being found. And also, it was proven later that it wasn't 30 plus people who had any idea what was happening. There were only actually two people who had an idea that something was up. Now, don't get me wrong. Two is still too, too many, but it's not 30 plus. You know what I mean? Now, of those two, one of these people was a friend and a neighbor the man that Marianne was drinking with after finding out that her girlfriend had been killed, Carl Ross. Apparently what had happened is the night before when Kitty was murdered, Carl was pretty drunk. He was pretty hammered and he started to hear a commotion outside. And when he started to hear the noise, at first he ignored it, but finally he looked out and he saw Kitty at the base of his stairs and a man, Winston Mosley, stabbing her to death. He didn't call the police. He instead called a friend and asked what he should do. The friend told him not to get involved, so he chose not to. He then ended up leaving his apartment by sneaking out the window and going into the apartment of a friend or another neighbor in the building and staying there. Later, when Kitty's body was discovered, Carl Ross was one of the people to call the police and report the attack, but by this point, you know, it, it was too late. And when he was questioned and asked like why he didn't do anything, why he didn't call the cops, he just said he didn't want to get involved. And it's really, unfortunate and really sad that he didn't because if he had Kitty might have lived they, they think that she had the possibility to have lived if she had not been attacked a second time but we'll never know now let's just say for argument's sake that the press's idea of what happened was correct and that 30 plus people witnessed this attack and this murder and did nothing to help how could this happen I actually learned about this phenomena in my psychology class and it is called the bystander effect. And what it essentially means is that if a group of people witness a crime, it's sort of like each of those people mentally passes the buck and the responsibility of helping to one of the other people present. So the more people are present, the less likely it is that somebody's going to help, which results in nobody helping. And though that's not really what happened in Kitty's case and that there were only two people, like I said, it is still too, too many. And it's just really, really sad because of the fact that it is theorized that she might have lived if somebody had done something. If somebody had just came outside or made a phone call or started yelling, Winston might have been too scared to come back and finish the job and Kitty might still be alive. But we don't know. Her murder is just really sad and it's hard for me to wrap my mind around people just not helping. I guess, I guess that's why they say to yell fire instead of help if you're in danger. But with that said, the, the death of Kitty Genovese had, I guess you could say a silver lining. That's kind of like a shitty thing to say, but something good did come out of it because Kitty's murder is credited as one of the instances, one of the crimes that happened that pushed for our 911 system to be put in effect and exist as it does today because prior to 1968, it didn't exist. So her death pushed forward for that to exist. And four years later, after her death in 1968, the 911 system was put into effect and that's why we have it today. So that's something, I guess. It just seems like it always takes something really terrible happening for things to be implemented to keep people safe, like this, Code Adam, Megan's Law, the little metal casings that are put on top of Tylenol bottles. Hopefully some sort of protective coating that'll be put on like containers of ice cream now, you know? I, I, I don't know. But let me know what you think down below. Had you heard prior to me telling you, had you heard of Kitty's murder? And if you did, did you hear the actual story or did you hear the dramatization that the media put out just like me and I'm sure many, many other people did. And a big takeaway from this that I would like to drill into you is, you know, if you see something, just say something, just call the police and do something. Don't, it, it could literally save a life, you know, just be, be good, be a nice person, be a helpful person, care about something and someone other than yourself. Cause that is literally, it's just very, very important. 
But anyways, guys, that completes this video. Please let me know down below of any cases you would like to see me cover in the future because though I have an ongoing list of cases that I'm going to cover, I love to have your ideas. I always put them on my list and I try to put the name of the person who suggested it so I can give you a shout out in the video. So please do that because I know that you're filled with good ideas and good taste, otherwise you would not be here. Of course, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out new videos every week and I would love to hang out with you, specifically you. Do you see my hands, by the way? Every single time I use a dark lipstick. Ugh. But anyways, guys, with all of that said, thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world on the internet. I think that's tight. I think you're tight. And I hope to see you in my next video.